All right, let's get ready for the weekend with one more mini lecture. And this will take us from amino acids to, protein, to peptides. We're not to proteins yet, but we'll get there soon. And it's the question of how do we name these things? Because we've talked about the amino acid names. Okay, when we put amino acids together, how do we name that? So just to remind you, we've shown this before. Condensation brings an amino group and an acid group together and creates a covalent bond. It is an amide um, linkage, which is like a functional group. Now water leaves, so we call that condensation because the water is leaving and condensing elsewhere from the molecule, it's being produced by the, by the molecule. And the other uh, way in which this name shows up is that we call the, what's left when you have a linked peptide, the uh, individual side chains that used to be amino acids are called residues. I probably already used that term for you. It's just why we use that term, because they are what is the residue after the water condenses away from them. So when you read, the one thing that you have to see is that the amino acids will be joined together in a chain. Which side of the chain do you start from? We start from the same way the ribosome starts. And so we're going to start with the amino terminus, and we're going to call that residue 1. And you'll see, in this case, if we're just joining together five amino acids, you can look at this and you can, you can see uh, tier, gly, gly, phi, lu. And so I want you to uh, quickly say what would be the single letter word uh, for each of these. You can pause and look at that. Okay, the answer is it would be Y-G-G-F-L, okay? Uh, and when you put it together, you could actually name it in the more uh, distinctive way. And I'll show you, there are many ways to name this. Uh, also be able to look at this and see where the side chains are going. See how the amide bonds come together. I will ask you to draw this. It's all the same, but you need to be able to draw it. If you can draw it once and then keep doing that, then you'll be in the good place for drawing it on the test. I might ask you to draw a peptide, and I ask you on the worksheet to draw a tripeptide. Well, I ask you to make one. So I don't technically say you should draw it, but you should be able to draw it, okay? So the, oh, and I should be clear that we start with the N terminus, and so we will read in that direction. We call this YGG, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the N terminus is the free amino group, the C terminus is the free carboxyl group. And that gives us a clear direction to how these are arranged. So a, peptide is, a polypeptide is like a charm bracelet. We have the backbone, and then we have the side chains coming off of it. So how you would name this? By definition, if you have like less than 10 amino acids together, you call it a peptide. You're not quite to the protein level yet, but you're definitely different from being just plain amino acids. So I want to give you a chance to look at this and see if you can name this one. Okay, let's go through and name it. You always start there. And do I have it? Okay, yeah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and name it, and hopefully I'll get it right. You have serine. You have glycine. You have tyrosine. You have uh, alanine. And then you have, oh boy, I hope I get this right. I think that is leucine. Because leucine is shaped like a Y. Isoleucine is shaped like an L. Let's see if I'm right. Yes, I got it right. Okay. So you can be the full chemist and you can talk about all of those as being groups that have been added on to leucine. And so it would be perfectly accurate to say that is serial, glycyl, tyrosyl, al alanyl, all of those as groups. The YL means this is a group of the primary molecule being leucine. But who wants to do that? So it's valid but it's not usually done. Uh, usually what we do is if we have time or if we're talking in the lab, then we'll use the three letter version or I'll sort of pronounce the three letter version. Uh, if we're talking about different peptides in lab, I'll say, can you grab the Sear Glide Tear Alalu? Okay. The other thing is, can you grab the S-G-Y-A-L? Um, and sometimes this spells out little messages, uh, not always. And uh, so you use what is most appropriate. If you're writing a computer program, you want to be the most efficient information possible. So you want to pick the single letter format. So it's obvious why proteins, now you see these things, and they will say that a protein named in this way is the longest word in, an amino, in, in the English language. So look at this. This is a word with 1,909 letters. 
and it's got the chemical formula. It's got 1289 C's and 251, 2051 H's. You know, it's got that chemical formula. Um, and it is the tryptophan synthetase A protein, which has 267 amino acids. Are you impressed? I'm not impressed because that's not even that very big of a protein. All you have to do is get a bigger protein, and proteins can keep on adding, right? You, you can keep on making proteins that are really huge. At some point, the ribosome just, like, loses. Uh, you can't go to infinity, but in theory, you could approach infinity. with, uh, And you can make as long of a word as you want because you can make as long of a protein as you want, right? So I see this, and I'm like, well, what about 268 amino acids? That'd be longer. Okay, then I'd have the world record. And then my friend would have 269. So... You see, it's kind of a pedantic kind of thing. And you actually can find this on a blog that Titan, which is known as the longest protein in many textbooks, is the longest English word. And they actually spell it out on this blog like we need more stuff. I don't think we really need this to exist on the Internet. Maybe it will mess up AI training models. And if so, that's a good thing in my view. But, um, yeah, technically it's a single word. But who wants to do that, you know? find a better way to represent it. So at the end of the day, um, we can look, talk about these things, but however we name it, we can name this. And if you look at this, let's start at the end terminus and name this one. Okay, so take a second if you need to. Okay, I'll go. It is alanine, glutamate, glycine, lysine. Lysine with an L. I want to be very clear about that. So it would be a... E, G, K. I think I have this. But you have the whole question of what is ionized at acidic pH or basic pH. This is what is ionized at pH 7.0. And your worksheet includes thinking through what's going to happen to each of these pKa's. You have two acidic pKa's, two basic pKa's. And you can work from there. Oh, let's see if I'm right. Hopefully I said it right. Okay, if I didn't, just edit the video for me, okay? And finally, there are uh, some of the uh, small peptides can actually be very active. In fact, some of them, we might not have been able to catch what they do in the body, but they might be doing important things. For example, if you are manufacturing aspartame, guess what you're doing? You're doing condensation reactions in some form because you're going to be taking amino acids and you're going to be joining them together. There is one thing that is not just the product of a condensation reaction, but it's more interesting organic chemistry. See if you can find that. Okay, if you look at that, look all the way to the right. What do you see there? You see an ester with a methyl group on it. That is not an amino acid. That is an organic chemistry addition. So what we really have is aspartame is a two amino acid peptide with a methyl ester on the C terminus. And you can name it as aspartyl phenylalanine methyl ester. That is a complete description. And if you're submitting this to the FDA for your testing, you would need to use a name like that. And just remember, we had this point out in class. Glycine got its name from being sweet. Glycose means sweet. It also gave its name to glucose. It comes from the same root. And so this is interesting because we have a sugar substitute that's a, uh, a peptide, but because it fits into the sweet receptor, it tastes sweet like sugar, but it does not con contain as many calories because a little bit of aspartame will activate more taste receptors than sucrose will. The same idea could happen with salt. There are peptides that interact with salt taste receptors. And if these are just peptides rather than sodium chloride, they don't cause the same chemical problems of having too much sodium chloride in the system. So there are uh, researchers that found sufu, which is an East Asian cuisine, and it's fermented, and it's got lots of amazing chemicals in it. Okay, I wonder if it's in that paper somewhere. But you can have peptides that are 200 times as sweet as sucrose, and you can have peptides that are 25% uh, more salty than salt. And the good news is they are also easier on your system than having too much salt because chemically speaking, they are not salt. They are peptides, but they taste like salt. So could there be a salt substitute? 
By the way, the regular salt substitutes are changing the element, not adding a peptide. They're potassium instead of sodium, which can help in many cases, but causes its own electrolyte imbalances. Peptides are not really electrolytes, not to the same extent that salts are. And so you can add peptides to your diet and it will not like give you hypertension. It's possible. We don't know until we study it more, but I think it's a cool idea to have a peptide substitute for salt. That brings us to our homework, which I've already presented to you. Have a good weekend. Thanks for listening and see you in lab next week.